and hope you enjoyed your lunch. Um, uh, I'm Joshua Yan from UMass Amherst. Um, so I'm a, a materials and uh, device guy. Um, so we uh, make different flavors of memristors for different type of applications. Um, so I'm here actually for the first time in this conference and uh, hopefully to meet with and discuss with uh, the experts in architecture, in algorithms, um, so that we can together find uh, the best way to uh, utilize the memory stores for uh, new computing. So in this presentation, I'm going to uh, first briefly introduce the key ideas we are already using uh, for the bio-inspired computing. And then uh, I will briefly introduce uh, what is Memristor, just for those who are not familiar with it. And then I'm going to uh, focus on showing a few uh, examples um, using Memristor for computing, but with different levels of bio-inspiration in it. Um, we all know it's trivial for us to tell the uh, difference between a dog and a cat, but it's not that easy for a computer to do that, right? So it's so easy for us to tell the difference between a male face and a female face. Um, again, it's not easy for computer yet. And uh, um, so it is trivial for us to go to the kitchen, make a cup of tea. But uh, if we ask a robot controlled by our current digital computer to do that, it's still very challenging. So um, are the cells in our brain and die all the time? We're still okay. But if the transistors in the CPU die, then we're in big trouble. Right? So the, uh, we know that digital computers, they are good in many, many things, such as uh, number crunching, uh, role-based reasoning, and um, so on and so forth. But it is also better at doing a lot of other things, such as pattern recognition, dealing with the vague and uh, incomplete information, so on and so forth. Yet those are the things the bio-inspired computer may be very good at. So this difference originates from the fundamental difference between the computing uh, paradigms of the two type of system. Uh, this community is very familiar with the, our classical computer has the problem, the Venoman um, uh, architecture. You have separate processor and the memory you need constantly. Um, move data between the two, a sequential process, analog uh, uh, data needed to be converted first, that can uh, then be processed. And also the device making those system cannot be scaled much anymore. Um, so especially this is going to be a big problem for uh, so-called big data era where uh, most of the computing are data centric, right? So that for the brain, it is totally different. It's uh, really uh, just a network with uh, neurons connected by, connected by synapse. And so the computing is uh, in-memory computing. It happens everywhere in the network. It's a parallel and the deal with analog information uh, directly. And uh, the devices uh, we're going to use to do this and also it's detectable and also it's uh, going to be uh, scalable um, than transistors I'm going to show you. So what is the key ideas we are um, already using for the bio-inspired computing? Um, it's really just the network, all right? So the brain has a network with neurons connected by those synapse. Um, so if a neuron is active like this one, it's the signals to its neighbors connected by synapse. So if two neurons are active or fire uh, around the same time, the connections between these two become stronger. So that's called uh, fire together, wire together. Um, and also the uh, popular spike timing dependent plasticity share the same nature of this learning rule. So um, if those neurons happen to be active, uh, if we see an animal with big eyes, small ears, and a pointed face, and around the same time, if somebody like a, um, my mom said cat, which will active, uh, excite uh, uh, add, uh, additional neuron in a different layer, and those neurons are active around the same time, they will be connected together, 
And the next time when I see uh, a similar animal, this extra neuron will fire quickly, help us to classify the image. Uh, if it is a dog, it's probably associated slightly with a different group of uh, neurons. So it seems, um, you know, in the classic computer, we provide rules, but with the bio-inspired computing, we learn gradually from examples, and we use the, uh, a network to do that. So in order to build a such network, we can, of course, use CMOS devices, and uh, um, but the CMOS devices were not created or optimized for this purpose. So it is not really efficient in doing that. Um, it takes multiple transistors to emulate one synapse. Takes the in, uh, actually cannot emulate, probably only simulate. So it takes uh, uh, even more transistors to simulate a neuron. And unfortunately, we have too many of them in the brain. Um, we have 10 to the 11th neurons, even uh, 10 to the 14th or 15th synapse. If we do a rough number calculation, we find uh, we need more than 10 million chips in doing that, in, in uh, simulate all the synapse neurons um, in the brain. We may not need to do that, but just it shows uh, um, the, the inefficiency, obviously. Uh, if it is possible at all to use those um, 10 million chips, so fortunately, we have emerging devices, such as the memristors. I'm going to show you that uh, we may be able to use one memristor to emulate one synapse and one memristor to emulate one neuron. And yet, those artificial devices are much smaller than the real um, biosynapse and neurons. So if you just do a number calculation, all the memristors you need to emulate those number of neurons and the synapse, um, it can fit on a four-inch wafer. So that, that seems uh, promising. So w what is a memristor? Uh, so just for some of you who do not know, it is a very simple two-terminal device. It has uh, um, three layers of materials, metal, oxide, metal, typically. But it also has very complicated physics, chemistry, materials, and electrical issues. So that gives us uh, the opportunity to have a rich device behavior for different type of applications. But it also gives us the headache to um, understanding the device to control the device property. So the typical form of the device is a crossbar structure like this. And here you're looking at 17 of them at each crossing point. There is one memristor. If you cut the device open vertically to look at the cross section, um, it has uh, two metal electrodes. Uh, in the middle, it's a very thin uh, switching oxide material. If you apply voltage between the two electrodes to switch it, and you can change the conductance of the structure by introducing some materials change inside. So this type of change can be volatile or non-volatile depending on the material system. So I'm showing here is a non-volatile example. Later I will show, show you a, a volatile uh, example. Volatile meaning the changes you put here can decay over time and zero bias. So this type of change will give you a signature of a memoristive device um, showing in the current voltage plot. It is a, a hysteroresistance loop. In this case, initially, if the device is in a high resistance state to a certain threshold voltage, it can be turned on. Then it follows this IV curve uh, as a high conductance device. If you want to change the resistance back, you can use opposite voltage to a certain threshold here. It turns off. Um, then follow this IV showing a high uh, resistance. Um, so this plot is uh, for the same data, but in the semi log linear plot, you will see such kind of plot for memoristors a lot in the literature. Um, so those type of switching has a lot of good things. Um, a long list here, but it also have challenges. Um, and uh, let me first uh, quickly show you some good things about those devices. It can be really fast. Like we, we have shown that um, it can be turned on and off repeatedly within 85 picosecond as an electronic device um, that is uh, 
fast enough for foreseeable applications. And it is highly scalable, and we recently showed that we can make a device at two nanometer by two nanometer in the crossbar array. And it is uh, almost analog, so you can um, easily, fairly easily get a 64 resistance levels. And it is stackable, so you can uh, um, stack them on top of each other. We published a five layer result, and recently we got eight layers uh, of memory result uh, to be published soon. So there are also other good things like ACMOS compatibility, and the volatility can be tuned, and um, you can get non-destructive reading, so on and so forth. Um, but it also has issues, um, and um, so, I list some key ones, there are a number of them, um, such as uh, the understanding of the device mechanism is still um, not very clear uh, after 10, over 10 years of studying. Somebody may tell you it's clear, um, but uh, I'm going to say actually not. That is, uh, the microscopic picture of the device is not clear, that actually prevent us from um, fabricate the best device with uh, uh, let's say infinite endurance, for example. So that is the one thing need to uh, still need uh, a lot of research. And also, if you want to use them, you use it in a crossbar array. Uh, in a larger array, you need access device, just like a DRAM. You store information in the capacitor, but you need a transistor with the capacitor serve as uh, the access device uh, in the crossbar array. So a transistor can be used as an access device for the memory stores. But if we wanted to um, uh, get rid of the limit by a transistor, we can uh, use a two-terminal memory select device, we call it a selector, uh, as the access device. But at this moment, we still do not have an ideal selector to use yet. And uh, for neuromorphic application, you need additional um, properties from the device, especially the dynamics, the diffusion dynamics. I'm going to show you that um, later. So those are the challenges. So even um, you know, those challenges uh, still prevent us from uh, have a large scale commercialization application. Um, but uh, we uh, still manage to do some um, bio-inspired computing demonstrations. Um, so those, uh, this is a summary of some uh, related result uh, we got at UMass. Uh, essentially, those are the results um, published in the last uh, uh, 18 months, um, it can be categorized into uh, three groups. Uh, the first one I call it the traditional AI approach. This approach, you do not have much bio inspiration in it. It's rather a network, uh, can do analog computing, in memory computing, parallel computing. But that turned out to be uh, good enough um, to accelerate uh, um, the vector matrix multiplication for deep uh, neural network. And uh, another group has more bio inspiration in it. Um, in this group, we are trying to um, emulate more faithfully uh, the synapse and the neurons and then build a neural network. And there are other things like the robotic application, security application, I do not have time to talk about those. So rather, I'm going to um, first uh, give some examples uh, for the not so much bio-inspired application first than this. So the example is um, a dot product engine which can accelerate vector matrix multiplication, which may sound trivial um, to others, but probably not for this community, because we all know vector matrix multiplication is a very big deal for uh, a lot of algorithms um, of a deep neural network. However, it is a computation intensive task for our digital computer, because if you want to um, multiply a vector with a matrix, you need to multiply an uh, element in the vector with the element in the matrix, and you need to do this one by one, then add the result together. It takes, uh, it's a sequential process, it takes a lot of time. Even worse, all the computing parameters are stored in the memory. Each step, you need to visit the memory, get the data, and send the result back, so on and so forth. It takes a lot of energy and uh, time. Uh, however, if you use a memoristic crossbar array to do this, to do the vector matrix multiplication, you can finish it within one computing cycle, 
regardless the size of the um, matrix um, or the vector. So this is how you do that. You know the memory cross bar array is naturally a matrix, right? So you can use the conductance of uh, each memory cell to represent uh, the mathematical value in the matrix and different uh, conductance value uh, give you a, a, a matrix with a different element uh, value. So then you can use, uh, uh, for example, the amplitude of a voltage in the voltage array to represent, represent a vector. So you apply this voltage array to uh, the rows of the matrix and uh, at each crossing point, it is a resistor seeing a voltage. You get a current here. So if you think about that, the current is really the multiplication result of the voltage and the conductance. It's Ohm's law, right? So you collect the current, you get the multiplication done by Ohm's law. So, um, and this happens everywhere in each cell simultaneously, it's parallel. And if you collect the current here, you're adding those current together naturally. So in order to do a vector matrix multiplication, um, you just need to apply the voltage and collect the current, one step. Um, so this can give you um, some uh, significant uh, improvement in the speed and the power efficiency in performing the vector matrix multiplication. So um, to implement this idea, we make the memory um, crossbar chip like this. Uh, so the, each cell is a uh, one transistor, one memory. Uh, the transistor serves as the access device here. And the largest array we have on this array, uh, this chip is 128 by 64. And those are the probes to marry it. So we can, uh, of course, make a larger array, but we will not be able to measure it with uh, the um, measurement system we have um, externally. So with this crossbar array, you can program the memory stores in the array freely, for example, to form a pattern of our major uh, sponsor. Or you can do something more useful to form a, a DCT uh, operator, that is the DCT operator, um, this uh, discrete cosine transform operator, which can help you to process signal quickly, or um, for example, compress an image. Um, so this is an uh, uh, image we sec select for the UMass uh, in the beautiful season. And then uh, we compress this image with the memory crossbar array I just showed you experimentally. And to compare, we use software to compress the image to the same ratio uh, with the same algorithm. As you can see, they are already quite comparable. And we can use the crossbar array um, as a filter to extract features from image, as you see in here, the original image and those uh, uh, filtered image using the crossbar array I showed you. So those can more or less be think as a signal processing or inferencing. And we can actually uh, also use uh, the back propagation algorithm to um, train the network for um, image cl classification, such as the amnist database. Um, so we uh, do it uh, called in situ supervised training. So we partition the uh, network into uh, two layers of neural network and the output uh, neuron, we have 10 of them uh, corresponding to the 10 um, uh, digits. And um, so we convert the um, free level of the, uh, the pixels into voltage as the input. And of course, before training, um, when you input an image zero, um, those 10 neurons fire randomly. And uh, so you tune the conductance of the memory in the array so that uh, only the, fire, uh, the first neuron fire if you input zero, only the second neuron fire you input one, so on and so forth. You finish the training. And uh, so this is uh, the process of the training. Um, so you can see with more and more training picture, the uh, classification accuracy for new images um, is uh, increasing, the accuracy increased uh, above 90%. And so 
this type of study actually um, also lead to um, some very interesting findings, like uh, um, shown here. If you have enough training images and um, the memory crossbar array performance, the real one, um, approaching uh, the TensorFlow. And um, even more interestingly, we find actually the in situ training uh, can tolerate or compensate uh, uh, a lot of defects in the crossbar array because it's a nano device. Um, you cannot expect them to be perfect. So um, this is important. We find that uh, even if your crossbar array have 11% device stuck in the on state, and if you use the in situ training, and uh, you can still get uh, over 90% of uh, classification accuracy after training. So if you do this with the ex situ training, you train it on in the cloud and then download the weight to the network and the uh, classification accuracy drop below 40%. So uh, in situ training really can be aware of the defect and compensate and self adapt to them. So that, that's a very good news. And also with uh, more layers of uh, uh, network, uh, you can get a better accuracy, one, two layer better than one single layer. With a more training image and with a larger array, even uh, with 11% of a stock device, you can still get uh, over 97% uh, of uh, uh, classification accuracy. This is based on simulation, and uh, those, those are the measurements. Okay, so using the similar accelerator idea, there are uh, uh, other um, very nice publications. These two are two examples, very fresh, less than um, two, less than one month old actually, aiming for, for example, higher precision by using multiple memory arrays instead of just one. Uh, this one uh, aiming for higher accuracy and efficiency in training by adding some CMOS element into the memory uh, cells. Um, so in all those demonstrations, actually, we are just have a programmable network. Right? We are doing the computing, just using in-memory computing, it could be analog uh, in parallel, but still um, it does not have much bio-inspiration in it. And uh, it is capable of some simple computing like uh, supervised learning. So how about adding more uh, neuron science principles in the device, in the array? Can we get uh, more uh, biorealistic computing, such as uh, unsupervised learning? So this is uh, the second um, group of uh, work we are doing. Um, so mainly to get uh, uh, more faithful devices, more faithful synapse and uh, neurons to the bio uh, counterparts and then get a neural network. So the, the feature, the bio uh, neuron science feature we choose to add into our device is uh, uh, the diffusion dynamics because it uh, turned out to be very important for the neuromorphic functions. As shown here, this is a bio synapse, the pre-neuron, post-neuron. And it turned out um, for the synaptic weight update, actually, it is more or less regulated by some ion diffusions, especially calcium diffusion is very important. So these dynamics really uh, give us, you know, uh, the, uh, the uh, neurom neuromorphic function because uh, the spike timing is important. Uh, our spike rate is all originated from the ion diffusion dynamics here. So that means, in addition to the traditional memory star as synapse, uh, we want to add another component into it that can give us a diffusion dynamics. So these two are um, two terminal devices. That means you just add a couple of uh, more materials in your device. It doesn't affect your scalability. So uh, the device we choose, the layers we choose to add uh, is a diffusing memory star. And as shown here, um, you have the two electrode, and um, in the middle, it is dielectric. In this case, it's silicon oxide. Those are the silver. So what I'm going to show you is uh, the uh, diffusion of atoms inside the device um, during operation. So using in situ transmission electron microscopic technique. 
So what you're going to see is uh, the silver migration um, and electrical bias, all under zero electrical bias. So you may not see this very clearly. Um, so we have snapshots to better uh, capture all this. Um, at the very beginning, um, you have uh, high resistance between the two electrodes. And now if you add uh, electrical bias to it, and uh, um, you see the silver migration and uh, um, the current increase, and eventually at this moment, the silver build a complete bridge between the two electrodes. The current jump to a um, uh, compliance current we applied. And if you keep this electrical bias and uh, the filament remain there, the diameter could be four nanometer. At this moment, if you remove the electrical bias you applied, you can see this silver filament is not stable and it relaxed back into a sphere shape, driving by thermodynamic principles. So um, this shows the silver diffusion in our device. And uh, we know in the biosynapse, it is another type of ion or atom diffuse, that's calcium. Uh, it uh, regulates the dynamics of the biosynapse. So we hope those physical similarity between the two systems can lead to the mechanism and the function similarities. So it seems this idea worked. Um, by, by this, um, the, the short-term plasticity measured from our device after introducing the uh, diffusion dynamics. It uh, naturally reproduced um, the complex short-term plasticity behavior of biosynapse. And also um, for the long-term plasticity, you can see um, we can naturally realize the, the spike timing dependent plasticity in our device um, and uh, also the spike rate de uh, dependent plasticity. So those are about the uh, synapse. So in order to build the network, we also need the neurons. And um, it turned out that we can use a diffusive memory I just showed you uh, with a capacitor in parallel. Um, so it can show very nice integration, fire, uh, and leaky uh, function with dynamics, as shown by this data. So this capacitor uh, could be an external capacitor in parallel with uh, the memory star. It could also be the intrinsic capacitor of the um, memory star, so that you don't have to worry about adding a big capacitor with the device. So this is uh, the synapse, uh, a neuron. Now we add the neuron and the synapse together. We can integrate them to form a small uh, neural network. Uh, it still has a very, very small size. And this is uh, um, the image of the synapse, the image of the ne uh, neurons. And even though the network is still very small, but after training, you can actually use it to differentiate uh, those letters, UMass. And uh, um, more interestingly, actually, it can um, perform unsupervised learning using the STDP rules. Um, because the interaction between the artificial neurons and the um, artificial synapse, um, it, the system can evolve um, with uh, um, some sort of input. Uh, we use three types of input, three patterns. M represented by um, the first high spikes uh, input here and uh, uh, last four low spikes. For S represented by two, uh, the first two high spike and uh, the last two spike as input here. So before um, you, the network is trained whenever you input uh, the pattern like M here, those three neurons fire randomly. But um, if you repeatably input M and, um, for 10 times, for example, and uh, the neurons fire and uh, um, the corresponding synapse got enhanced and the synapse evolving and uh, that is uh, the self-organization process. And you can uh, input S 10 times, A 10 times, total 30 times, and you find actually the network evolve into a 
format that whenever now you input M, the first neuron fire, input S, the second neuron fire. In other words, the, the network is capable of unsupervised learning. And, and so far I'm talking about our, our resistive neural network. Um, how about a capacitive neural network? So um, you can use capacitive synapse, capacitive neurons. In order to do that, you need to build a um, MEM capacitor device. We do not have quite have a MEM capacitor device, but uh, we build a pseudo MEM capacitor, as shown here. So those devices turn out to be uh, uh, more, even more closer to a uh, uh, neuron. Like you see, this is uh, the um, uh, membrane potential profile you expect from a bioneuron, and this is uh, uh, the measurement from our device here. They are quite close. And we can also add a transistor into each diffusive memory uh, uh, mem capacitor here, and we can get uh, the signal propagation capability. So this neuron can propagate signal from one layer to the other. So with those components, we actually can build a fully capacitive neural network, uh, like shown here. Um, it's still very small. Those uh, are the synapse, those are the neurons. So this small neural network can also um, show some uh, learning capability, such as associative learning, um, as demonstrated by this data. You probably have seen this uh, many times for the resistive neural network. This is uh, likely the first time uh, demonstrated with a capacitive uh, neural network. And um, so this um, network can also um, do inferencing. Uh, for example, it can conveniently uh, classify spikes with a different rate. So um, those new capacitive neurons will fire depends on the multiplication of the spike rate with uh, the uh, capacitance of the synapse. So it's uh, essentially uh, a capacitive version of uh, a dark product engine. So, um, you may see why you want to have a capacitive network. Um, the major reason is that we think it may have even more energy efficiency because now um, you do not have the static current uh, running through the wires. Um, so that, that current um, running in the resistive network may turn into heat and got wasted. Um, okay, so the take home message I want to have is uh, the bio-inspired computing is needed for um, applications that our classical computing is not good at, such as those. And uh, the traditional silicon devices were not created or optimized for this purpose. Um, so the emerging devices, such as Memorista, um, are likely um, a good candidate to build such system. And uh, we demonstrated the Memorista uh, 128 by 64 121 hour array to accelerate machine learning. I showed a few examples. We also realized some more biorealistic artificial synapse, neurons, and build a small, very small neural network that shows pattern classification and unsupervised learning functions. We also demonstrated a capacitive neural network with inferencing and learning. And uh, we, uh, if, and I guess uh, all of the magnitude of energy efficiency um, and uh, throughput are evasioned for those computing paradigms. Of course, this is something we needed to have uh, more discussion uh, with uh, the algorithm and the architecture people to uh, prove that. Um, so uh, finally, I'd like to thank my coworkers, especially Professor Chang Feixia from UMass Amherst. We work closely together on most of the result. And uh, the graduate students, postdocs, and also my collaborators from HP Labs, Jiang Pao, Jiang Stan, and uh, our collaborators from Duke University, Iran and Helen, and uh, from uh, Air Force Research Lab, Qing Wu and Mark, and a few others and also the, uh, some um, good discussion with Mark and uh, Chris uh, from the laboratory of, uh, laboratory of Physics Science. And uh, finally, I'd like to thank my sponsors for all the work, and thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to answer questions.
Hello. Yeah, very impressive work. You know, like uh, I have just a few comments. Like first, see most of your application using like uh, an array. Have you tried to like like try different arrangement where you have to all to all connection or more connection between and can it be realized with the memostat to have like uh, multiple connections and self feedback for the memostat itself? And the other question is about this very interesting capacitive. You know, there's a big field about nano capacitive MEMS, you know, or micro. Is that something related or different? You know, there's the field of uh, micro electromechanical system that's based on capacitive loading and capacitive. Is that completely different than what you're doing or similar? Um, so I guess uh, the first question is about have we tried different um, type of network? Yeah, so it seems my understanding most of what you presented was array kind of thing where you have input and then you output. But this kind of recurrent network where you have a lot of connections between the neurons, can it be realized with the memostat configuration or? So, uh, so far for the uh, network level of demo, the fully memoristic uh, uh, network and the fully capacitive network, uh, what we try first is a very small scale, uh, less than 100 uh, uh, devices there. And also the, uh, con uh, the pattern connection is a standard uh, crossbar yeah. uh, connection of the uh, neurons sitting at the end of each column. And that's the only, uh, only. So, so like for more, more complete, what do you see like what the, what's needed to move it like uh, not more neurons, more like connections. What the thing, do you still want to use transistor to do the connections like ob amps or, is, or do you think there's a configuration where you kind of achieve multiple connections with still within the memory stat world, you know, do you think can be done in the future, or you have to use some other kind of, you, as you mentioned, like ob amps or other stuff to make those more connections. You know. Um, in fact, for the for those for those network, um, you see, we have the synapse, we have the neurons. They directly connect yes. to each other, and and though they directly talk to each other yes. without uh, uh, you know some uh, uh, medium CMOS layers without any CMOS device. That's, that's uh, important. So for example, if uh, with a certain input, um, because the dark product here, this neuron fire, then it will um, enhance, for example, the synapse here. They directly inter interplay with each other that way. That is um, important for the self-organization. We do not have uh, um, uh, as a intermediate layer, and we, we haven't tried uh, other configuration geometry, and uh, believe me, even this demonstration yeah. takes a I lot of tell, time. Yeah, it's, it's very impressive uh, Yeah, so but that, that yeah. could be uh, yeah. tried in the future. Yeah, yeah. And the next question, you know, um, I'm an expert in the field of micro electromechanical system, like a capacitive devices. It's yeah. Like you mentioned by the end, this. Do you think there's something related or different? You know, like. Uh, uh, I, like yeah. uh, I'm not quite sure what type of device you talk about. So for this, um, this type of device, it is an electrochemical system. Mm -hmm. um, so it has, a, a, you know, the, the silver as the electrochemical active ions diffuse in those uh, um, dielectric, you can call it electrolyte. Yes, you're speaking sure. about the capacitive star, not the MEMS resistor, the, yeah. the, the MEM capacitor, like uh, the MEM capacitor. There will uh, be dielectric material, like has, or, a, has you know. the similar has the similar uh, structure here. Those are the MEM MEM uh, diffuse.